You may sense a little bit of a theme uh, from the songs that we sang. And uh, last week we discussed unity in the community, uh, which is a definite challenge today as the forces that divide us seem much louder than the forces that seek to unite us. We are called to unity, as we see in Ephesians 2.15, where despite our cultural differences uh, in, in Messiah, Jew and Gentile are able to come together as the one new man, uh, as described by Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, may we pray for unity uh, in the community and in our nation. And also we uh, pray that the Lord would just um, reveal truth for us as we uh, study the word this evening. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we thank you for uh, the many blessings that we enjoy, and we thank you for the revelation of your word uh, as we explore uh, tonight, as we dine uh, on your word, as we seek truth from your word tonight, Lord, that we might bring glory to you, that we might uh, have a greater understanding of your calling on our life. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> this week we are going to uh, get back in sync, back on the schedule with the calendars that we sell in our gift shop with the rest of the Jewish world uh, in terms of the Torah portion as we cover uh, this evening uh, portion Kadoshim. Uh, Kadoshim is the plural of Kadosh, which means... Holy. All right. Yes, we saw that in the Psalms. Uh, in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, uh, the Lord tells Moses to speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you are to be holy because I am holy. The instruction to be holy applies to the entire community, not just the leaders or the priests, but to all of the people. Now, it's easy to see the plurals of community in the Hebrew and the Greek, but we don't always see it in the English. Fortunately, we're in the South, and here we have y'all, or you all. Uh, of course, I, was growing, I grew up in New Jersey. Use guys works also. Um, but we are going to emphasize the community aspect that uh, is reflected in the Hebrew. So, for example... Uh, Leviticus 19, verse 2, the idea really is you are all to be kadoshim, holy ones, ki kadosh ani Adonai Elohechem, because I, the Lord, you all's God, am holy. Peter quotes this verse, uh, as Rosalie read earlier in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, where he writes, as obedient children... Be not conformed to your former desires, which were based on ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all behavior, since it is written, you all are to be holy because I am holy. Amen. Now, if you were to ask most believers today, if we are supposed to be holy, they would likely answer, Okay, <clears throat> well, in my message, it says yes. <clears throat> so y'all aren't so sure. We're going to work on that. Uh, because I, I was going to say, then you might ask, how do you know that you are holy? If they said yes to that, and they might say Messiah makes us holy. But if you asked how he does this or how they know this, they might then say, I don't know. Uh, they might struggle a bit to give you an answer. And one reason is that many believers confuse and conflate righteousness and holiness. And there are similarities, but there are also differences. For example, can an object be righteous? No. But can it be holy? Yes. yes. Anybody know the first time the Hebrew word kadosh, holy, is used in the Bible? little Bible trivia for you here. Well, somebody knows the answer, but I'll give you a clue in case you didn't hear that yelled out answer. We raise our hands. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the Hebrew is Admat Kodesh. 
Uh, it's found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, where Moses is told he is standing on holy ground. Holy ground. Numerous things in the scripture are described as holy, but we do not find any instance where an object is described as righteous. Righteousness is used only regarding the Lord's and his human creation. <coughs> but we are just like David, who says in Psalm 51 verse 5, that he was a sinner from the moment of his conception. Ever since the fall, we are no longer righteous. Even worse, we're unable to correct the problem. We're unable to achieve our own righteousness by our own efforts. Only one person has ever lived who was completely righteous. And it's not me and it's not you. Only Yeshua lived a life where he was always morally correct. Amen. Psalm 14 verse 3 says, There is none who does good, no, not one. Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, quotes this verse in Romans 3.10, but he says it this way, There is none righteous, no, not one. So if we are unrighteous, how are we able to achieve righteousness? How are we able to come into the presence of a holy and righteous God? The answer is we have to have the righteousness of Yeshua being seen in us. And that is something the Lord has provided by his grace that we are able, despite the unrighteousness of our flesh, to be seen as righteous as long as it is not our righteousness, but Messiah's righteousness that is being seen in us. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a practical example uh, I was once told about a pastor who asked his congregation to stand if they thought they were righteous. And most of the congregation stood. Then he told the people to remain standing if they thought they were as righteous as Billy Graham. Fortunately, the young people aren't here tonight, so I don't have to explain to them who Billy Graham was. Um, one of the challenges of uh, speaking to the young people, they're not always as up to... Uh, they, Things that happened 20 and 30 years ago that are fresh in some of our minds, uh, they have no understanding of. Anyway, uh, as, as a result, about half sat down. Then he asked of those still standing uh, to remain standing if they thought they were as righteous as Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul. And only a few remained standing at that point. And then he asked them to remain standing if they thought they were as righteous as Yeshua. And only one person remained standing. And I must admit, I was thinking that this man had one seriously overinflated opinion of himself. But then the pastor pointed out that the man who remained standing was the only one who understood how we are seen as having the righteousness of Messiah because of his sacrifice on our behalf. Whoops. I guess I kind of missed the boat on that one, even though I often quote 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which says God made this sinless man, talking about Yeshua, become a sin offering on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Anybody know the first time righteous is found in the scriptures? Raise your hand. That, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> In Bereshit, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, Noah is described as a tzaddik, a righteous man before the Lord. Later in Genesis 15, verse 6, when Abraham believes that the Lord will give him a son, when he believes the Lord will be faithful to his promise to him, it's counted to him as tzedakah, as righteousness. And I should also point out this term is used to mean good in a general sense as opposed to evil. For example, Psalm 37 verse 21 says the wicked borrows and doesn't repay, but at Sadiq, a righteous man is generous and gives. So now uh, I'm hoping that this has given us a better understanding of our righteousness as believers. Let's see if we can work on better understanding our call to holiness. I believe there are two reasons, make that three, 
why most believers uh, struggle to understand this concept. It started out as two, it grew to three, and I forgot to change it at that in my notes right there. Three reasons. The first is the issue of understanding that instructions about holiness, for the most part, are given to us as a community, as we've already talked about. The second reason holiness is not well understood in the body of believers is because it's, it is um, linked to the concepts of clean and unclean, something most believers do not concern themselves with today. We see this with food in uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verses 20 through, 25 through 27 uh, in this week's portion, which says, you all shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean and between unclean birds and clean. And you all shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you all shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from all other people that you all should be mine. If someone becomes unclean, they would have been unable to participate in any of the tabernacle or temple rituals, uh, including bringing a sacrifice for their sins until the point where they were deemed to be no longer unclean. But clean and unclean could also affect the community as people who were unclean had to isolate themselves. Uh, remember that uh, in Sara'at, which is often, uh, I would argue, wrongly uh, translated as leprosy, and we've uh, recently explained why uh, we disagree with that translation. But um, <clears throat> Sara'at was a spiritual uh, condition that could not only uh, afflict someone because of some purpose of the Lord, but if you came in contact with them, uh, it could, you could become afflicted with it as well. It could render you unclean as well. So essentially, the spiritual defilement of being unclean, and that wasn't the only situation, um, could cause somebody else to become unclean if they came uh, in cont into contact with you. So essentially, spiritual defilement can be contagious. And we're told to separate ourselves uh, from that defilement, just as we're to separate ourselves from the contamination of this world. Uh, and one way is by being different, by not doing things the same way the world does. Uh, one of the reasons for that, if we are just like them, we have nothing to offer them. We have to bring them a different message. We have to bring them solutions to the problems in this world. Uh, and so we can bring a message of faith instead of fear. We can bring a message of trust in the Lord instead of leaning on human understanding. We can bring a message of unity instead of division. We can bring a message of unconditional love instead of a love that is given expecting something in return. And every time we display unconditional love towards someone who doesn't deserve it, right? That's what the definition of unconditional love is. Um, they aren't going to deserve it, but neither did we. When God demonstrated his unconditional love towards us by offering up his son as the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for our sins. And we understand and appreciate that even more every time we display unconditional love towards those who do not deserve it. And that is something that the world cannot understand. The world frequently tries to do the right thing, tries to be good, but because the motivation is not in return for what God has done for them, they are unable to uh, fully display unconditional love. Uh, love in the world usually comes with some sort of condition um, attached to it. And there may be moments where people are able to, in the world, are, are able to show love in an unconditional way, to do selfless things. I'm not denying that they, they don't have their moments, but to do that over the long haul is a work of the spirit in our lives. And it is very, very difficult 
uh, for people who do not have that leading. And if we ever see somebody in the world, and, and there are some uh, who act very selflessly, it, it, seemingly to us, that should just be a challenge to us to do even better because we are called to be ambassadors for Messiah. And if we come to the world with a message that is different than theirs, and if we demonstrate unconditional love towards them, that is something totally unexpected. And therefore it can get a, a response uh, that can overcome barriers uh, that, that may exist. And so if in human terms and fleshly terms, the world seems like its heart has been completely hardened to the truths that have been revealed by our creator. But we, he is able to soften hearts in this world by actions that they don't expect. Everyone wants to have hope. Everyone wants to be loved. And we have the opportunity because that is the message that we're supposed to bring. And so we are able to bring the message of God's love. And he's given us a unique calling and unique experiences and unique gifting such that we trust that the people who he brings into our lives are the ones that we are uniquely suited to be able to minister and to be able to say the word or to show the compassion that they just need right at that time to soften their hearts and open them up to a truth that they may deny over and over outwardly. But deep down, the pagans know that the gods they worship are uh, the product of their own hands. They, they made them themselves. We worship the creator of the universe. And that is a miracle working God who can take any circumstances and turn them around, who can provide purpose to our life and meaning to our suffering and blessing in the midst of the trial. And we bring that message of hope and encouragement. The third reason that um, holiness is not uh, often misunderstood, um, well, let me go back a little bit. While righteousness is, uh, comes through Messiah's sacrifice on our behalf, our holiness is determined by our actions in our daily lives as we are being conformed to the image of God's Son. Romans 8 verse 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This involves removing the unholy from our lives, the things that are not of the Lord, so that we might be suitable vessels that he can use for his purposes. And now I come to the third reason. So uh, the first one is that a lot of the instructions are given uh, in communal terms. The second one uh, is that um, the, there's frequently uh, a confusion between uh, holiness and righteousness. And the third reason, I think that's the second one. Was that the second one? Let's see. Um, yeah, we'll go with that for a moment. Uh, let's see. Oh, clean and unclean. The fact that um, people are not aware of um, the concepts of clean and unclean because uh, they think that that just goes back to Moses. And in reality, uh, it goes back a lot further than that. It goes all the way back to the time of Noah. Noah. Right When he was told uh, in Genesis um, 7, verse 2, what animals to bring on the ark by the Lord, he told them to bring seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of each unclean animal. So we see that uh, this has been uh, in existence before the Jewish people e even existed, before Abraham was even born. Um, the concepts of clean and unclean uh, already existed. The third reason uh, is that most of the instructions regarding holiness are found in the Hebrew scriptures, what they sometimes call the Old Testament, uh, which uh, is a term that suggests uh, that, and that, that they're taught as a result that it's no longer meaningful to them today. And the reality is it does say in Hebrews 8 that um, many of the concepts that were uh, in, in, uh, instituted through the Mosaic Covenant are in the process of being replaced in the final covenant renewal 
Uh, the new covenant that has been inaugurated by Messiah in his first coming, but is yet to be completely fulfilled. And therefore, the uh, instructions in the Hebrew scriptures are still meaningful to us today, which, as we talked about last week uh, in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Yeshua said, as long as heaven and earth are still in existence, then not the smallest letter or the smallest stroke shall be uh, abolished in the uh, Torah or the prophets until everything is fulfilled. And I don't know about you, but I am convinced that everything has not yet been fulfilled because I am waiting for the soon return of my Messiah and the sooner the better given the state of this world today. However, the darker things grow in this world, the brighter our light is going to shine. So uh, I'm always looking for the uh, silver lining uh, in, in the dark cloud uh, because my God is able to take all things and use them for good for those who are called according to his purpose. He is able to supply all of my needs. He is able to lead me by his spirit. And he, uh, that way I don't have to lean on my own understanding, but I can trust uh, in the revelation of his spirit and I can trust in the revelation of his word uh, that he has provided that contains eternal truths, uh, universal truths in many cases uh, that give me instruction uh, that <clears throat> provide guidance for my life. In the... Um, this week's Torah portion, we can learn a great deal about holiness. Uh, this week's portion, Kadoshim, is Leviticus chapters 19 and 20. And I would encourage you to read these two chapters sometime in the coming week if you can. And here is what you'll find. Fifteen times in Leviticus 19, it says either Ani Adonai, I am the Lord, or Ani Adonai Elohechem, I am the Lord, you all's God. He's speaking these words to the people as a community. Their holiness is to be a reflection of who their God is. And the truth to, about the children of Israel is true for us as the body of believers. That's our, that's our larger community. Our smaller community is the congregation. But as the body of believers, we're ambassadors. We're giving a testimony of who our God is. And if the world looks at us and all they see is unholiness and all they see is us bickering with one another uh, and, and arguing over whether or not we're doing things right or, you know, just all the little different distractions that are out there right now, arguing over politics and what's going on in the world today, instead of saying, Lord, help me to understand your holiness because holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But he's called us to be holy because he is holy. And so <clears throat> we are a testimony to the world, just as the Israelites were a testimony to the rest of the nations. Leviticus 19 verse 3 says, Honor your father and mother and keep my Sabbaths. Ani Adonai Elohechem. Verse 4 says the people are not to cast gods of metal. Ani Adonai Elohechem. Verse 11 says, do not steal and do not lie. And verse 12 says, do not swear falsely and do not profane the name of the Lord. Ani Adonai. What does that sound like? It sounds a bit like the Ten Commandments, right? But then we have some verses that are a little bit uh, uh, additional requirements. Verse 9 says, leave some of the harvest in the fields and orchards for, orchards for the poor. Um, <clears throat> So we find out that even taking care of the poor can be a reflection of holiness. Uh, holiness is not all about isolating ourselves from the world and getting off in some corner and saying, you know, okay, Lord, I want to be pure. The ch that, that's pretty easy to do uh, as long as we have our mind submitted to the spirit of the Lord. But the challenge is to interact with this world and still present that testimony of holiness. And ministering to the poor uh, is an aspect that the scriptures reveal are, are part of our call of holiness. 
Verse 10 says, do not gather grapes from the ground or the vine. Leave them for the poor and the sojourner. Depends on your translation. Stern says foreigner. The Hebrew is ger. And the, the term sojourner was, some, was someone who wasn't Jewish, but was dwelling in the midst of the Jewish community and was to be treated virtually the same, certainly in matters of worship. Uh, and in matters of concern for their welfare, the sojourner, the one who was dwelling in their midst, uh, was to be taken care of. Uh, they were not to gather grapes from the ground or the vine, but leave them for the poor and the sojourner. And then in verse 18, we come to love your neighbor as yourself. We call this what? The golden rule. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The golden, no. Uh, the original context in which this instruction was given is a community statement. As Neil read earlier, don't take vengeance or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite. Instead, love your neighbor as yourself. God called his people to be separate, and he called them as a community to be a testimony. And the testimony was to have blessing within the community so that those outside the community would desire to be a part of the community of the people that serve the Lord. It wasn't that we endorse everything that's going on outside the community. It's that we are able to show the love that God has shown towards us. It's so that as a community, we're a shining light uh, on a hill. And he followed that with Ani Adonai, I am the Lord. Uh, in Leviticus 19.23, it talks about uh, something we've talked about in the um, past concerning when fruit from trees can be eaten. For the first three years, the fruit is not to be eaten. In the fourth year, the fruit is holy and is for praising the Lord. And in the fifth year, the fruit can be eaten. Ani Adonai Elohechem, uh, I am the Lord, you all's God. And this is why... Uh, the Jewish people have a new year for trees called Tu Bishvat, so that we know how old these trees are and what, uh, how we are to treat the fruit from these trees. In verse 30, the Lord tells the people once again, my Sabbath, you all shall keep. This time adding, and you all shall honor Mikdashi in the Hebrew, my sanctuary, Ani Adonai. The sanctuary was the holy place in the tabernacle where the Lord would dwell. Today, the closest thing to the sanctuary is where we come together as a community for the Mikra'e Kodesh, uh, the holy assemblies of Leviticus 23, the weekly Sabbath and the seven annual appointed times. We should honor the place where we keep the Torah, the revelation from the Lord given to Moses on Mount Sinai actually a copy of that, uh, created by scribes um, who are specially trained to make sure that they uh, have the word, the revelation um, accurate, even passed down over thousands of years. Um, we should honor the place where we come together to worship, uh, where the spirit of the Lord dwells in the midst of a community of believers. Our behavior should reflect that. Um, the way we talk should reflect that. The way we dress should reflect that. And certainly the way we treat one another should reflect that. Leviticus chapter, and, and that's why in, in the traditional synagogue and here we try to do the, th the same thing. We try to maintain a certain level of decorum in the sanctuary. We ask that people not bring food and drinks other than water uh, into the sanctuary. And... Um, we try to show respect and even ask the children uh, to behave a little bit better in the sanctuary than they might in the fellowship area, even after the service. Um, <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 20 starts out forbidding the Israelites to practice the child sacrifice of the pagans. Uh, in Leviticus 20 verse 6, the Lord again says, sanctify or consecrate yourselves. You all are to be holy ones because I am the Lord your God. Uh, the, uh, next, the people are told not to curse their mother or father and not to commit adultery. And that's followed by a banning of certain inappropriate sexual relationships, which were practiced 
by the Egyptians uh, whom they had just left and the Canaanites where they were going. According to Vayikra, Leviticus 20, verse 23, this is why the former inhabitants were removed from the land. But in the previous verse, Leviticus 20, verse 22, the Lord says to the Jewish people, the land will vomit you out if you practice the same abominations. We, Because uh, a lot of times people read a verse that says it seems unfair to remove the former inhabitants. But the Lord says it was because they were willing to offer up their children as a sacrifice unto the Lord because they practiced certain things that even their society said is abominable. And yet they still do it. Um, and as such, uh, he said that, that, that the land which belongs to him is going to be represent his holiness. And he is not going to tolerate those kind of activities in the land. And so he took the inhabitants out and he gave that land uh, to the Jewish people because he promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is a promise-keeping God. But even though he has given that land to them, that doesn't guarantee that they will stay there. According to this verse, if they practice the same practices of the inhabitants, they're going to get kicked out. Doesn't mean they won't return at some later point, but it wasn't like he would turn a blind eye. God never winks at sin. Uh, he has provided the way to deal with sin, but he never ignores sin. It must be dealt with. We are also continuing our study through the book of Joshua. Tonight, we're looking at chapter 18. Uh, as uh, it's traditional, uh, I mentioned we're back on schedule to read through these uh, portions to go through the five books uh, of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible in the course of a year. And then every year we start over again. But we're going through Joshua because uh, the book of Deuteronomy ends with the Jewish people on the banks of the Jordan making preparation to enter the land. And I want us to know that they actually got in, uh, that God fulfilled his promise. So in chapter 18 of Joshua, in verse 1, the people are assembled in front of the temple of meeting uh, in Shiloh, Shiloh. The land of Canaan, Canaan, has been subdued and is being distributed by Lot. So far, uh, we have a graphic that depicts that land east of the Jordan uh, has been distributed by Lot uh, to the tribes of uh, Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh. And the parts of Canaan west of the Jordan uh, have been distributed by Lot, as we read earlier, uh, to Yehuda, Judah, the half-tribe of Manasseh, uh, and Ephraim, the two sons of Joseph. Uh, and there are still seven tribes who have not yet received their allotment of land, and apparently their enthusiasm for this process is a bit lacking. Uh, Joshua asked them in verse 3, How long will you delay going in to take possession of the land, which the Lord God of your ancestors has given to you. Joshua instructs the remaining tribes, as we read earlier in verse four, to select three men from each tribe to go through the land. And then verse five, uh, in verse five, uh, they're told to divide it into seven portions. In verse six, lots are uh, cast to determine who gets what portion. Once again, we're reminded in verse seven that the tribe of Levi uh, the Levites do not receive any of the seven portions because the office of the Kohen, the priest, is their inheritance. And then in verse 11, we're told uh, about the land that uh, Benjamin, Benjamin uh, obtains by Lot, uh, that um, his descendants uh, are, receive the land between that of Judah uh, and the land of the sons of Joseph. Uh, and according to verse 28, the land given to Benjamin includes the city of Jerusalem. The rest of the distribution of the land is described in the next two chapters of Joshua. Tonight, we've seen that as God's people, we're called to holiness because he is holy. But being holy is challenging for us as we're continually exposed to the defilement of this world. Fortunately, like David in Psalm 51, verse 10, we can ask the Lord to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. We've also seen tonight that the only way we can be seen as righteous 
is by accepting the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua on our behalf. So we're going to give the opportunity to do that right now. If you are here and you have not accepted Messiah's sacrifice on your behalf before, we are going to give you the opportunity to do that. As I'm going to ask with every eye closed and every head bowed, all you have to do is just raise your hand to say yes to him and you can put it right back down to say, yes, Lord, I want to accept your sacrifice on my behalf so that I might be seen as righteous by the creator of the universe. Is there anyone? All right, I wanna to talk to those of us who are already believers. Perhaps you didn't understand the difference between the calling to live a holy life and being seen as righteous by our creator because of Messiah's sacrifice on our behalf. But you now realize and desire to live a life that is holy uh, unto the Lord, to replace with holy things the things of this world that we have allowed to defile us, to uh, ask the Lord to set us apart to be used for his purposes, to create in you a clean heart and to restore a right spirit within you. Uh, as I would just ask right now, if you feel the Lord leading you uh, to make a commitment in terms of holiness or perhaps some other area he may have shown you. I would just ask you to raise your hand, not that we're going to call it out, but just so that you will know that you are making this commitment before the Lord and that it will help to seal uh, the commitment and that you are saying to God, yes, I want to be holy. I know it's not easy, but I know that if you call me to it, you can help me to better understand it and to better fulfill it in the days ahead. Lord, we thank you that you are a holy and righteous and promise-keeping and faithful God, and that you see us as righteous because of something that we could not do on our own, but something that you provided in your grace, the sacrifice of your son. And Lord, we know that you've called us to be holy, and we ask you to make us clean, to take out anything from our lives, that is unholy in your sight, that we might be clean vessels to be used for your purposes. As we say, not my will, but thy will be done. May we bring glory to you in all that we do. And may our lives be a testimony to those who don't know you, to our people Israel and to all the world. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming.